Keeping venomous reptiles is an unforgiving hobby, requiring proper training and lots of experience. One simple mistake can be the difference between life and death. death, death. Remember, the most venomous snake in the world oh, is the whoa. one that just bit you. There are no venomous snakes with training wheels. Just because you see Viper Keeper handle snakes a certain way does not mean you should try it too. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Viper Keeper here. I'm at the St. Louis Zoological Park with uh, curator Jeff Etling. Uh, they're a bit under construction now, improving their facilities, uh, protecting more endangered uh, wildlife. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff or Mark, uh, his associate, will uh, give us a tour this afternoon. Mark, you want to talk about some of the babies here since sure. you know Hatch while I was away? So. Sure. Uh, well, we've got a, a couple. Uh, we've had a, a little bit of success with the uh, northern spider tortoise. As you can see, these little guys were born a year ago, yearlings. Wow. Um, uh, first time for St. Louis, so it's a pretty significant move for us. This one was two year old for two years ago, the first one we did which is a very interesting tortoise species because mm. they require a diapause through incubation period. So Really? We actually, uh, what we do now is take the egg and put it into a, a cooler uh, 66 degrees as soon as they're laid, dry, for about six to eight weeks, and then we move it to an incubator with a good temperature for the rest of incubation Wow, period. that's fantastic. Is that really unique to that species? It's or actually are there other species Actually, that do that? what we're finding out through some of Brian Horn's work is there's a couple bands that run across the world, mm -hmm. and if turtle species fall within those bands, then the diapause is somewhat necessary for incubation period. Not 100% necessary, but it seems to have a lot more success rate in hatching. Okay, very interesting. This is a little animal that just hatched oh, we love two babies. days ago. This is a baby Egyptian tortoise. Oh, look at that little guy. Hello. Oh, yeah, bob your head. Oh, you know who this is, huh? Yeah, it's Viper Keeper. This is a species that we're really excited about. This is McCord's box turtle. Hi. And uh, the McCord's box turtle is an animal that we believe is extinct in the wild. We're not 100% positive, oh, but goodness. the thought is that um, up until last year, there had been no males produced in captivity, only females hatched. You think that's temperature dependent? 100% temperature dependent through egg incubation. Mm -hmm. And what we did is went ahead and incubated a much lower temperature. Uh, and it helps to produce males, and we believe we produce six males. Excellent. So if that's the case, it's going to help the population immensely. Wow. Yeah, I get to a, a lot of zoos around the country, but you guys are really, really active in both uh, field studies and, and working with spe uh, species as well as here at the zoo. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Well, you know, when, uh, when Dr. Bonner, our CEO, came on board in 2002, um, he looked at the fact that we've been doing all this great conservation for almost 30 years or more. But we were, as he said, an inch deep and a mile wide. We were putting money into all kinds of things, doing our own things, helping other people. And so we decided to kind of rein that in a little bit. And we developed a, what I call our conservation branch of the St. Louis Zoo, which is called the Wild Care Institute. And we have 12 centers under that um, umbrella of Wild Care Institute that we actually, um, all the curators uh, were able to pick an area of the world uh, or a species that was, uh, you know, in need of conservation, um, and so, or, let me back up and say, or maybe it was an area we had expertise in, or that we knew that was in need of work that no one else was paying attention to. So, it really has allowed us to, you know, kind of get out around the world and here in our own backyard, because we have two projects, uh, one for the American Bering Beetle, and then one for uh, Hellbenders right here in Missouri. So, um, both of those are really great projects, and I really, um, bodes well with the community to see that we're not only helping other species around the world, but we're taking care of our own stuff right here at home. Very cool, very cool science. Uh, we got going here, there's some different things. We've got pancake tortoise eggs, more Egyptian tortoise eggs, uh, paleocytus, dwarf caiman, uh, bushmaster eggs, which uh, we got some Tenefreeze. which is a, we're really excited about, the um, first for us. It'll be a first for us and the eggs are looking pretty sharp. Wow. So. These guys should be hatching, really depending on incubation temperature, we're hoping here in the next maybe three weeks. So, Which is really cool because when uh, I started here in 1987 as a keeper, we got in some Central American Bushmasters and, uh, you know, the typical, you, you know, you have the problems with back mate and wild-caught Bushmasters, you know, and they have the whole regiment of issues. But we made, got a bunch of them through all that. And then um, when I came back, I went and worked at Wichita for uh, three and a half years as a curator out there. And when I came back 16 years ago, we still had one of them here. And I sent it down to Colette Adams down in mm -hmm. Brownsville. It was a female we had here. And it subsequently bred. And then we got three of the offspring back. And the female 
is actually the mother of these eggs, and it bred with a male that was um, from the Detroit Zoo. Oh, okay. So it's really cool because you think about it. For I mean, obviously, there's some people out there that bred all you know all the different uh, forms of Bushmaster, but uh, Muda is probably the one that's more commonly bred. You know, Dallas didn't, but uh, the Central American forms are a little you know seem to be a little less commonly bred. So we're really excited about the Sorry. fact that we can uh, we can do that. So yeah, I have some Muda from uh, from Rustin also and. Mm -hmm in the collection and I've got going with a uh, breeding project going uh, also um, um, but uh, yeah, I'm good friends with with Matt Harris and Dean Ripa and uh, so I, we can exchange babies mm -hmm. to keep bloodlines going yeah, and yeah. such so very cool yeah mood uh, are really uh, very very interesting snakes to keep and uh, and certainly something you really need to be on your toes with. Oh, wow. yeah. I think it's certainly one of the most dangerous uh, pit vipers that you can keep. Actually, those and Bothrops are just evil characters. Uh, uh, well, we'll show you the setup we have, we used for uh, you know, reproducing. Did you, did you spend any time on the floor at all? No, I let's let's, let's go ahead and look at the, well, show you a little bit about the history of the building, then we'll go down and we'll go cut through the Fine. basement. Okay. Uh, and we, we're, having a, we're having a stellar year for uh, Baby vipers. So we just had some born two days ago. Some uh, Central Turkish mountain vipers, Monte Vipera, oh. Alpha Zona. We just had another born. It's the third time we've had them reproduced. Oh, okay. Here. But um, this building is is actually, you know, I don't know if you saw all the front, the whole. I did. The I did. The architecture. Sculpture. But this building was uh, constructed in 1927. Um, Marlon Perkins was the first. Right. Curator. Right. Of course. And one of the things that a lot of people don't. Um, know about Marlin is that you know, he started out here as a groundskeeper at the zoo and George Verrill Harrell, who was our first director and had that position for 40 years um, from the inception of the zoo and well 1910 is what we're saying is our starting date he, I think he started a little before that but he was director all the way up until uh, Perkins came back and took his spot in 63 but when they uh, when the zoo museum district was formed in the early 1970s um, they had to make some decisions of what things to renovate, what things to just tear down and rebuild. And a lot of our facilities, like the uh, you know the old cat house and the eight building, there was nothing you could do to them to make them better. So they just tore them down and built new ones. Now the three historical structures that were all built in the late 20s, early 30s, this building, the primate house, and the bird house, were all designed by John Wallace, and they all had the Spanish architecture with the tiled roofs and the stucco and that. Yeah, this, this, and you couldn't I, replace those. And so they did, made a decision that we want to save our history, but put in you know modern you know exhibitry. So the bird house, we did piano wired you know units, and then in the in the primate house, they went to glassed in, ventilated, so they could keep the public and the primate uh, air spaces separate. You know, and then in here, what we did was we, we kind of kept a combination. The best of the old or the best of the new. So these four big units in the three lot the center building, those are original. Those are original 1927 units. And it used to be that adjacent to those, there were six other ones that were the same height, but they were narrower. They went down. And there was a mirror image on all four corners. Um, the atrium is original, and the solarium was put in at the same time, but it, it originally it didn't have the pools in it. It was just an open area that they had freestanding cages in. Um, if you look at photos of the building and the day they opened, this place was just literally in here was just wall to wall people. And uh, prior to the renovation in 77 in the old building, there was a, a railing, wasn't quite as ornamental as this, but similar. It was about three foot out from the unit, so you couldn't get it close to it. Um, so in 77, when we closed and did a year long renovation, they put in all these two sided glass, fiberglass, you know, ABS units, and mm -hmm. fiberglass units too. And then about probably, well, I guess it was 12 years ago now, we came back in and we downsized even more and we put in some of these new, bigger fiberglass units so we could do multi-species exhibits. Um, we still have about probably, I would say, between the pools and the exhibits, about 78 units. But uh, our diversity is still real high. We really didn't lower our diversity. We were able to actually increase it by putting more things together. It, it allows us to do a lot of more in, environmental enrichment. We can do thermal zones within these enclosures. So it's been really a win-win situation for us. And in uh, the summer when we have our big crowds, you can get more people up to really look. I mean, we have about 3 million visitors a year. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we, we get a lot of people. I mean, uh, 
we're at the tail end of our real busy season now because school's getting ready to start back up. Plus the heat stifles anybody from doing anything. Oh yeah, it's toasty and uh, very muggy outside. Like I said, it's like Tucson in, in, in July and August. It's just awful out there. Well, one of the things we just did this past year is we renovated this atrium area. All this, this rock work you see along like the planters here and then all this is all original, but what we did was these were originally looked like swimming pools. They were just smooth, you know, mm -hmm. and our exhibits guys came in and did some like artificial like, mud looking banks and we created some sand pit areas for nesting. And we have a large uh, Asian narrowhead soft shell turtles in here. Uh -huh. And then also we have a fly river turtle in here as well. And then the other side, we made it into three enclosures as well for Asian turtles. This whole outer area is all dedicated to Asian turtle conservation. We were able to make it look a lot more naturalistic than what we had before, a lot of roots and uh, mud bank work, so. Excellent. One unique little feature about the lamps in here, the fixtures are all snakes, all antique from 1927. There we go. Even the lights on the inside here are hung on snake rods, all 1927. Yeah, that's uh, very hard to get these globes replaced. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Little snake hangers and all that cool stuff. That's very, very unique. Well, you think about in the 20s, I look, I always have always looked at this even when I was a kid, is that someone would take the time, this kind of intricate detail, these cobras and turtles and frogs and everything else. Oh, yeah. And there's no way you could ever replicate that. And I, you know, in this building, this, this massive, you're going to see we've got a basement that fits under the whole under the side of this thing. Because originally when it was built, it was not just, the reptiles were on the upper level. The lower level where we have crocodiles and big tortoises, now that was a small mammal house. That's how they sold it to the commission to build a reptile house. So they were going to do mammals with reptiles and amphibians, but they didn't tell them that the reptile portion was going to be three quarters larger than what the small mammal size was. Yeah, I love the way they thought about that. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, and then uh, the other thing is that we have a drive-in basement, and originally that's where the commissary was, the storage for like all the distribution for, you know, they called novelties, you know, the gift shops, all that was down there. It's only been probably in the last 25 years that we've got control of the basement and, it, and we're starting to really develop that as you'll see so reptiles um, rule <laughs> well, we like it now 16 years ago we finally got cooling in here we didn't have when i started here in 87 we didn't have air conditioning here except for two areas uh -huh. this bunker area here and that corner and that's where we kept most of our amphibians and our high elevation reptiles everything else if it was hot like this forget it oh yeah it was a nightmare oh now, uh, yeah i could imagine so uh, uh, We've been able to, in the last 16 years, air condition all three of our old historic buildings. They're zoned, so we can actually, for the first time, we can group animals by what their their needs really are. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. He's probably happy in the weather outside oh, yeah. right now, or she. Um, yeah. uh, we're actually hoping this next year, um, since we did this renovation over here, we're hoping to renovate this all into one big exhibit for Komodo dragons. We have a we have a recommendation to breed in the next year or so, so we want to make big enough space that we can house a pair. So we're, we're okay. working on it. Okay, guys, you're going to be treated to some just unbelievable uh, different species of uh, viperids uh, here. Um, Jeff's an expert uh, in the area of. Uh, uh, the Eastern European trans transcaucasian, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. transcaucasian uh, viperids, uh, uh, as well as you know keeping some of these nice uh, animals from Costa Rica and such that we don't normally get to see because uh, they're very rare and very costly. She's been basking for a while, big belly on her. We're hoping she's grabbing right now. Uh, Chinese uh, crocodile lizard, in case you didn't catch that. Beautiful habitats, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a small time collector, I, I can only uh, dream about, you know, nice enclosures like this with, you know, I've got water cobras, they would just, oh, they would really love to, to have an, uh, an enclosure like this. You know, something big for my kings would be very nice too. One thing we pride ourselves on are live plants. There aren't any fake plant enclosures, all live stuff. And even on a lot of our exhibits, we've actually matched uh, a plant locality to a snake locality. So we have a connection with Vanderbilt University and a couple other major institutions that allow us to get some very unique plants also. Ah, very cool. Amiga viridis uh, hiding in the, uh, in the bushes here. 
the Revere disc. Uh, if you don't see the whole thing, sometimes you can think it's a, uh, a, a niche eye, an Atheris niche eye. Um, very, very cool animals. Here's a species I've not seen before, Vietnamese long-nosed snake. Head right there. Yeah, I guess he uh, lives through the name. <laughs> uh, lizard eater? Well, probably in the wild, they eat rodents in captivity. Okay. I, I bet in the wild they probably sure. eat a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah, um, you'd be surprised. Um, uh, you know, I have some uh, Viper Renardi, uh, and I was all set to start the babies on, on crickets because, you know, they mostly eat invertebrates in the wild, and uh, the things wouldn't eat the crickets, but were chowing down on pinks like crazy. I was, I was really surprised. It sort of fooled me. I was yeah. like, I was expecting, you know, crickets. Like all my baby Eckes eat crickets. Yeah. Um, so I was going that route, and I was pleasantly surprised that they would eat frozen thawed right out of the yeah. out of the oven, so to speak. Yeah. Very had, I was telling these guys that our, our new field site in southern Armenia, we had uh, we had Armenian vipers that were burping up, uh, you know, big katydids in the bag that we had them. So wow. the adults are eating big orthodoctrine insects, but it's amazing some of the. Um, the mass ratio differences between the size of the food item they're eating versus the snake. Mm -hmm. We had one snake that had 44 grams of the rodents in it, and it was like a 150 gram snake. I mean, wow, that's they, they eat, that's they eat, a third or so. Yeah, they, they've uh, they're some of the fattest wild snakes I've ever seen in my life. The, the prey density at this site is so high. You're walking around during the day, and there's rodents running around in the grasses. You look at a piece of sheet metal, and they scatter. So I think the snakes there are just. We're doing really well. We had a, a Macrobiptera levitina obtusa that uh, regurged uh, a microtus and some sort of bird. So they're, they're catching these birds too. Wow, it, the architecture as well as the detailed carvings is just fantastic. And look at that, look at that guy. You don't see architecture like this because everything's poured out of a bottle by these architects. and. And none of them want to take the time, even though, you know, to do intricate stuff like that, you don't have to do it by hand. You can do it by CNC mill, and they could they could turn it out. They just don't think out of the box anymore. That's very very cool stuff.